Welcome to another edition of Famous Interviews with Joe Domino. On this episode, we talk with author, teacher, and foundation owner, Sandy Sharmataro. She is the author of a children's book series called The Good Eggs, and subsequently started a nonprofit called The Good Eggs Foundation, and that is to help kids in need. Her books teach kids the importance of virtues, diversity, and service. She is also a high school educator, and from a young age, she loved reading and writing, along with having a heart for service. She offers a lot of great insights into her life and future. Enjoy this interview. Hi, Joe. How are you? I'm wonderful. How are you? Oh, doing very well. Thanks. Good. Hey, thanks for taking a minute out today. I appreciate it. Of course. Of course. Thanks for having me. Let's kind of dive in here at the top. And I think probably the first thing that I want to know about is Mm -hmm. it's been an extraordinary time on planet Earth for the past couple of years. I'm curious what maybe you have learned about yourself over this time that's made you, that's going to make you stronger as the world kind of wakes up and reemerges and your projects that you have kind of get cast in a different light. Well, I think what I've learned the most, you mean through COVID and everything, I mean, um, I am also a school teacher and the word flexibility comes to mind and that there's yeah. more ways to get something done. So if you think, well, we've always done it this way, well, maybe not. You know, maybe there's a new way of looking at things. And that has really come to light a lot for me in the last two years. You know, sometimes you get in your routines and then you're forced to look at things differently. Oh, it's never going to be the same. But you know what? I've discovered some things are even better. You know, we learn as we go. And maybe we don't want to go sure. back to our <laughs> So. I agree. And I think there was a part of us when this happened, we didn't know how long it was going to go or it's like, well, when we get back to normal. And I don't think there's any way that you could just go back to anything. I mean, we've been, no. things have been altered so much. So, and you see yeah. that as a teacher, you know, with oh, the kids. Time. Let's get kind of to the beginnings of this idea of the, the good eggs and you being mm-hmm. a teacher. Let's go back to your childhood. Talk to me a little bit about where you were born and raised and what kind of fostered these ideas of who you are today. Okay, so I was born in Gross Point, Michigan. I don't know if you're familiar with that area. It's a suburb outside of Detroit. And I was brought up, you know, in a pretty basic, you know, mom, dad, brother, and me. And, you know, my parents were always really great models of just kindness and compassion and generosity. And I think that kind of stuck with me. And when I got to school, my favorite, I'd say third and fourth grade were probably my favorite grades. And our teacher would always give us, um, every month we got a new list of spelling words, and she said, create a story around these words. And that was my favorite assignment. I just loved doing that. A lot of the kids would moan and groan. They didn't like to do it. And I couldn't wait to get that assignment because I always came up with a new story. And then we would have to read them in front of the class and they would laugh. And I said, oh, they're laughing. And they they like this story. And so it just kind of fueled me to, to write more. So then I wrote a few little plays in school. And then, then, you know, you grow up, teenager, high school, you know, college, go to work, married, have kids, all that kind of put on the back burner. But it was always in my mind to write a children's book one day. My kids grew up, and I felt like I'm going to do that now. I finally have this time. It's never left me. I've always wanted to do it. And I wanted it, you know, to be about teaching, about goodness, about just being a good person. And at a kid's level, how can they do that? So I just thought through, it took me two years to write the first book, and I wanted it to mimic a school year, so um, and a, a year as well. So there are 12 chapters, so one for each month, but they start in September when the kids go back to school. And then each month, um, in book one, they learn a different virtue. So for example, September, um, they learn about understanding. A little, you know, kid situation comes up, and they learn how to deal with understanding somebody. You know, October is forgiveness, November is gratitude, generosity, cooperation. It goes on and on for 12 virtues. And, you know, I was really excited writing about it. And you see the eggs grow throughout each month. And by the end of the year, they've really learned so much about relationship with each other. So I thought that was going to be it. And then I felt something inside of me saying, you're not done with these little characters. So I um, said, I'm going to take them around the world. And we learned about diversity. 
So I did a lot of research at book two, and we ended up visiting, not me personally, but in my imagination, uh, 10 countries that they went to, like Chile, Zambia, Australia, Japan, India, Egypt. There's 10 all together. And they learn um, different culture and language and customs and landmarks. And they meet other eggs around the world. And they come to the conclusion that, you know, we really are all the same. Maybe we're different, yet down deep we're all the same, you know, that we would want to be heard, we want to be respected, we want to be known. And we all have so much in common. So that's how they end up for that year. And I said, well, one more. i got to do one more with them. I'm going to teach them how to be ambassadors in their own community. So after they come back from that trip around the world, they stay in their hometown. And this book has a half a dozen, six chapters, but they're twice as long. And they learn how to help kids. And they learn how to um, respect the elderly. And they learn how to help animals. And go, they go to a food bank. And they put on a health program. And they go to a nature center. So it's like three years in their lives. And it kept morphing as I kept writing. So now I know for sure this trilogy is complete because that's the feeling I have when I was done with the last page. I cried when I wrote it, but I knew it was done. So that's how that all unfolded. Seems to me that's a pretty important thing right now, not only with kind of the afterglow of what we've gone through. I think there's been a Mm -hmm. level of regression with the kids, but I Mm -hmm. think that there's Mm. the, the simple grasp of things that maybe prior generations were used to doing is kind of lost on these kids. There's a, there's just yeah. a different mentality that goes into our reality. And I think those basic things and stories of growth and just elemental things, I think it's a, probably a pretty big deal. It is. And the kids have really been responding to them. I was so excited. Um, I had a fifth grade teacher email me and she said, you know, my class wanted to do all of book three, the service part. They did everything that the eggs did in the book. So they helped Um, kids in their community. They put together baskets for the elderly. They collected um, supplies for an animal shelter. So they did um, everything that the eggs did in book three. And I said, that's exactly what I want to happen, that kids can really look at others and have a compassionate response. So that made me very happy. (laughs) Absolutely. Well, you know, you were talking about having an imagination and this desire to, to, to write early on. What was your dream when you were a kid? Was it always to kind of get to this point, or did you have other dreams? When I was a kid, I mean, I would have loved to have been, well, I feel like I am now a writer, but like like one that maybe does book shows, which I do some book shows now, but, you know, where I used to love this movie where this author was signing books and people were lined up. You know, I really had no idea what kind of book at that point. But I just I just loved um, writing and telling stories and having people enjoy them. So, like, book tours were always kind of a dream of mine. Um, and, you know, I, I always wanted to have a family as well, which I did. And different, I mean, pipe dream. I like to be a singer, but I can't sing. <laughs> but I really uh. love music. So um, just different, probably the writing would be my biggest, like now it's it's even morphed. My big dream now is to have these books get made into like feature films for kids and maybe even do, you know how Sesame Street Live has those big theater shows? The Good Eggs Live and, and have kids come and fill out a theater and laugh and, and enjoy and really get something out of the show. And then all the proceeds from that I could fund back into my foundation and do some really big eggings, as I call them. I could see that happening. What was your favorite when you were younger? Maybe a, a children's book, or mm-hmm. what, what's mm-hmm. been a book that you've always relied on and loved? When I was very young, my favorite book was called A Fish Out of Water. And it was like a Dr. Seuss-type book. And it was about a little boy who, I don't know if you ever heard of it, but um, in fact, I bought it when my kids were born, so I could have them read it too. A little boy who bought a little goldfish, and the man at the store told him, be careful how much you feed him. He'll get too big. Well, the little boy didn't listen, and obviously he overfed the fish, and he kept trying to get more bigger containers to put the fish in. Finally, he put the fish in a bathtub, and he kept growing. He took the fish to the public pool, 
and they put them in in the public pool. Like each, <clears throat> the fish kept getting bigger and bigger, and and he had to go call the man at the pet store who came and did this special food to the fish, and he went back into the goldfish bowl. He got small again. So I just always loved that story. What's it like yeah. to run a nonprofit? Um, you know, you, you have a dog, but you also have what, – what's that like? So the nonprofit actually morphed out of the book. So I wanted to actually put the books into action. So, um, again, I would like to help children who, you know, really can't – you know, children are at the mercy of adults. So um, I really like to help them – have a, a comfortable childhood. So it's been a labor of love. It's been a lot of work um, starting from scratch. I mean scratch. Um, I did put a board together, so they helped me out too. And what I do is I seek out organizations or families. Sometimes people come to me and say, hey, can you egg this person? And I follow the book. So I do it once a month, like the book chapters are month to month. And I seek out an organization or a family that um, – may have a need for kids, and I call them up and I ask them, do they have an immediate need, and they might tell me, and I'll say, you've been egged. And they'll say, what does that mean? So I said, I'm going to provide for, like this last one we just did was called Macomb Foster Closet, and they needed some baby monitors. So we were able to provide 10 baby monitors for them. So different things like that. One family came to me, and they told me the, a woman they know got laid off from her job, a very hardworking mom. She was devastated, and she had to stop her little girl's dance lessons. And we called her, and we said, you've been egged. Well, your little girl's going to dance. So we're going to provide her dance lessons. So all different things like that. I've done over 30 eggings now, and it's, it's just been a joy. I just love doing it. That's why I, I want these books to get bigger so I can do bigger eggings. I would love to um, build playgrounds, you know, for underserved schools um, and help with bigger things if I could. Um, so right now we're starting out and doing what we can, where we can. It seems like that's probably more important than ever now in the kind of the inflation yeah. that we're going through in this post-COVID uh, world. It is. And, you know, people might think, oh, you really don't have to do big things. And that's true because little things, I see the looks on some of these little children's faces. One of my favorite eggings was um, this family was getting a new start in life and a new house. And they didn't have really anything for the house. And we went in and we got everything for the kids' bedrooms. They had three kids. So there was a little girl and two boys. And I asked the mom, like, what pattern of bedspread they would like. And so the one, the boy likes video games. So we did all his bedroom and video games and got a comforter with video game, you know, pattern on it. The little girl wanted hearts. So we did her whole bedroom and hearts. And just she started jumping on the bed. And they were just so excited. I just I just felt that we could do that little thing for them, just to see their faces so excited. That's all you need, you know? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So what do you like the best about what you do? Like every day you get to teach, you, you have mm -hmm. the nonprofit. What is it that you look forward mm -hmm. to the most? Oh, I look forward to being with the – I teach high school. So the, I, the, the nonprofit and the books are more for elementary age, but I teach high school. I teach at an all-girls school. And I look forward to being with them every day because it's different every day. Um, they're so funny. And, you know, we just build such great relationships. And I just I enjoy being in that school environment. Now, I would love to retire very soon and run the nonprofit full time. That's another dream of mine, to get this um, at a point where I could, you know, live and still, you know, have like a salary from it and just do this full time. Um, I would love to get out there more and seek out more people who need help and do that on a full-time basis. I mean, it kind of is, like I'm working two full-time jobs right now because I do the, you know, teaching by day and I do the eggs, all that stuff in the evening. So it's a lot, but I would like to transition all over to the nonprofit in the near future. So mm -hmm. what's been the best fan experience letter that you've gotten in response to your books? I'm trying to think. There's been quite a few. I had a mom email me, and she was somewhere with her son. And somebody was talking about that they gave something to somebody. I don't know the exact circumstances, but it was like around Christmas, and they were giving to somebody. And her mom, the boy, pulled on his mom's arm, and he said, 
Mom, that's just like the good eggs when they were generous at Christmas. And so he made a connection. Um, and that's another thing that I want kids to connect, you know, that, yes, you should be a generous person and, and try to think of others. And he connected that to whatever this other person was saying. You know, the mom didn't even think he was listening. <laughs> and here he, he pulled this out. So that was very, very uh, comforting as well. And I've gotten lots of good feedback, lots from teachers saying their kids really enjoy the books. One teacher told me, They would have a routine where the kids would go out for recess and then they'd come back and read a chapter of The Good Eggs. She would read to the class and they'd say, "What? what's Benedict going to do today? And and what's going to happen now? And how did Reggie fall off his bike? You know, like they were really into it. So I'm glad. That really makes me happy because that's what I wrote it for, for the kids and for them to learn and to love the characters. So do you think writing for, you know, a younger audience, helps you relate and do things in a different way for the high school audience? High school, you have to, you know, it's a whole different ball game, really. I think I could use these same ideas and just ramp them up. So, yes, I think so. Um, it helps me relate better um, to the kids on a more, you know, it can't be an adult level because they're still kids, but they're not elementary kids. So it's kind of an in-between. So, yeah, I, I can definitely adapt them that way. But they're all kids at the end of the day. As much as we think yeah. high school kids have this accelerated right. grasp, they're really all a bunch of kids. You know? Oh, yeah. Um, mm-hmm. They're very fragile. And, and they're not – yeah, absolutely. And I think more now than ever before. Um, mm-hmm. I actually have a, a 17-year-old and a mm-hmm. 16-year-old. So, I, yeah, I totally get it. Yeah, I think um, COVID set them back a bit. Yeah, and I think the weird thing is is that, you know, people in our age bracket have lived most of our lives without this, and this is more yeah. and more their reality, especially grade school kids. I mean, this has been yeah. a big chunk of their life. So, And, and I don't know that we're going to be able to kind of pull the camera back from this in a macro way and see exactly mm-hmm. how it's affected them until later on, you know. Um, You're right. But I think and- every little thing will help. I think so. And I think it's going to, you know, we're just going to have to be patient and we're just going to have to take it slow. And, you know, we might just have a new normal, but it doesn't mean it's going to be bad. You know, it might, maybe it's, maybe it's a good thing that we're going to rethink or revision, you know, um, how we do things. It, it, It can be positive too. Well, you talk about the greatest generation came out of a war. I think probably this has been kind of akin to a war, although this affected everybody on the planet. But I think, I've noticed with my kids that there's a level of them that, you know, when things would get canceled, there was a different feeling prior to this. And now, like you said, there's an adaptability that we all have to uh, hone into. And maybe these kids will be adaptable in a certain way that will be, I don't know, different and better. I think um, so. They won't be so, so stuck in a one way. You know, they'll, they'll yeah. like I said, that word flexible always sticks with me through this whole thing. <laughs> yeah, so. for sure. And let's say you have a dream tonight and you run into the younger version of yourself around mm-hmm. the time you were in your 20s. And you mm-hmm. could tell your younger version something, one thing, piece of wisdom, based on what you've learned throughout all these years. What would you tell your younger version? Well, I like to quote something my dad always said. <laughs> and it's actually, it's actually a phrase that, really resonates with a lot of different traditions. It's just said in a different way. He always would say, you know, a hundred years from now, you'll never know the difference. You know, because you get worked up about something and, oh, my God, uh-huh. oh, this, that, uh. he said He would always call me and say, you know, a hundred years from now, you'll never know the difference. <laughs> and it's, it's like this, he's just trying to say, it's all okay. It's all good. You know, it's all going to work out. Don't get so worked up over something. Um, so I think that's what I would tell my younger self or my, yeah, my younger self to just, just relax. You know, it's all going to work out. We're all going to be okay. Less stress. <laughs> that could have avoided a lot of stress if I would have listened to that phrase. So. Absolutely. That is a good phrase. I think about that with different phases yeah. of my life. And I'm like, I don't even know what bothered me 10 years ago. You know, it's like it's weird. Exactly. How old exactly. that, yeah, it it just kind that, of washes how, away. With the girls at high school, I'm like, girls, really, really, <laughs> you're going to be okay. 
take it from me. You're going to be okay because, you know, everything's a big blown up deal. I said, uh, it's okay. <laughs> so, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So as a teacher and, and, and running a foundation, you know, what do you want your legacy to be? When people look back on your life and who you are and what you've done, what would you ultimately like them to remember you by? My big word is always kindness. I would love to be remembered as somebody who, you know, really looked somebody in the eye and heard their story and really was concerned for them, not thinking about what you're going to say next, you know, but really listening to their story and being kind and being understanding and being compassionate, you know, looking looking out for the other, not focused on yourself so much. Um, and, I, you know, I'm always a firm believer, too, that, you know, we rolled a, a lucky dice here. I mean, you could be born anywhere. You could have been born, you know, you can't control where you're born. We came up a pretty good role, and a lot of people didn't. A lot of people got, you know, a bad role. And that I like to see that and to help foster that along because I have anything I could ever want. You know, I don't, what do I need? I don't need anything. But a lot of people have needs, and I'd like to be known as someone who tried to help somebody's life to be a little bit better. My final question is this. Everyone has a perception of who they think you are, your family, your friends, those that read your books that have been a part of your classroom, but ultimately you're the one that le le leads your life. You have a perception of who you are. Who do you think mm -hmm. you are? A person who is in tune with humanity, I would hope so. Um, I feel very um, much like I love to learn a lot. I love to get other people's perspectives, and I love to put all that into practice. So I just feel I'm a person of, of compassion and of, um, you know, kindness and goodness and always trying to refine and get better. Sandy, hey, thank you for taking some time out today. This has been great. Great to get to know you. Thanks for the time. Of course. Thanks for having me. And if you know, if you want any more info, you can always go to my website and check that out. Leave me some feedback. I appreciate your time too, Joe. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another famous interview with Joe Domino, where we cover the world of art, literature, and music around the globe. Most of the music on our episodes comes from Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. And if you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino in the iTunes Store. You can also see the interviews on the Neon Jazz YouTube channel. And for everything Joe Domino related, go to JoeDomino.com. And there you can donate to keep this alive through PayPal or Patreon. Until next time.